Hey everybody, welcome to Deep Dive Wednesday. Give me some shakas in the chat right now. It's so good to be with you and what an incredible testimony by that beautiful couple in Manila who shared their link in order to get more of their family members and their friends to be able to join and watch weekend services with them. It's so good to be with you here on this Deep Dive Wednesday. If this is your first time, my name is Mike Kai. I'm the senior pastor of Inspire Church. And it's such a privilege and an honor to be with you this evening, wherever you are in the world, whether it's late at night or early in the afternoon. So good to have you on Deep Dive Wednesday. You know, this past weekend, we wrapped up our series on culture. Uh, I found it very, very refreshing. It was interesting because I never thought that culture was something that we would need to teach during this season. But Dr. Bragenberg brought it to our attention. He said, so many people are joining the church, thousands online, and there are people who are new who are coming to the in-person services on the weekend. Praise God that we can still have church services, creating our own bubble here in Waikele, Honolulu, and in Mililani, even in Manila, at some point that'll happen, to make sure that everybody that enters into our bubble, just like the NBA, the NBA playoffs, the bubble in Orlando, um, we're creating this bubble. So when you come here, you are healthy. And when you come into a healthy atmosphere, God does amazing things. This past weekend was phenomenal. If you did not get to check out that message, please go to our YouTube, go and find it. It was on culture. And we talked about the final three, three things on culture of Inspire Church. And that was faith, love, and humility. Faith, love, and humility. My goal this past weekend was to stir up faith in people that in a season like this, we need faith now more than ever before. That's why my book, The Pound for Pound Principle, talks about taking what you have and multiplying it, even no matter how small it is at this time, no matter what's going on, no matter what setbacks, the situation, that you can still maximize what God has given you. Because why? Because the writer of Hebrews says that we are not a they that shrink back. We don't shrink back. We continue to have great faith through this season. And it's been quite a long one so far, about eight months now, but I really believe that through this, even the best things come out of this. So when we talked about our cultural values that inspire church, a lot of churches probably have the same cultural values because these are the things that bring honor to God. The first thing that we talked about was honor, excellence, and generosity. Honor, excellence, and generosity. We talked about the Queen of Sheba and her visit to King Solomon. The following week, we talked about David and how David was creating culture in the cave before he even took over the kingdom. And this was his mighty men, his 600 mighty men. And he had his inner 30. And within that, he had his top, he had his top military advisors. And in that, we talked about unity and how important unity is. The Bible says how good and pleasant it is when we dwell together in unity. Right now, more than ever before, our families need unity. Our state needs unity. Our country needs unity. We need unity in the United States of America and Hawaii, and I'm presuming in your country as well, wherever you're watching this. So to the global family in Ho um, from Hawaii and throughout the world, I want to say that we should be people who are marked by excellence, generosity, and honor, that we honor people. You know, I was convicted driving over here. I was talking to one of my good friends, Pastor Matt Higa, and we talked about how often do we pray for our president, pray for our governor, and praying for our mayors of our cities and counties of Hawaii. And so what we did was we started praying for them on my drive over here to, for this taping because it's so important for us to pray for those who are in authority. That's called honor. We want to honor those who are in authority. And then we talked about honor 360. We talked about humility, serving, and this today I want to talk about faith. I want to deep dive faith with you. I want you to come with me to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 and in your Bible in the New Testament is going to talk to us about a great man at the point. He wasn't such a great man, but his name is Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus. As a matter of fact, it says in Luke chapter 19, verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. Now, if you know anything about Jericho, Jericho was a cursed city. This is the place where the Israelites marched around it seven times, uh, um, for seven, one time for seven days. And on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. And they shouted and the walls came down and the city was cursed and said, may it never be rebuilt. But it was rebuilt at the price of a firstborn son and the last son by a man that I forget his name, but it was recorded in first Kings. Now, when you look at this, when you look at the city of Jericho, now Jericho has risen from the ruins and Jesus is, is, is making his way through the town. 
I find it very, very interesting at this moment that instead of Jesus going around the town that was once previously cursed, Jesus decides to go in through the town. I want you to know right now that no matter what situation you're going through, no matter what's happening in your life, if you're thinking that your life is cursed, if you're thinking that you made some mistakes that you'll never be able to come back to church, or if you'll never get back into the ministry again, or you'll never be able to do what you once did, I want you to know that your life is not cursed, that Jesus is coming through your city and through your town because he has an appointment with you. And he has an appointment with Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, it says in verse two, in, in the region, and he'd become very rich. In other words, he was a tax collector. And in those days, tax collectors were hated. They were semi-mafia, okay? They were, um, they were money collectors, uh, debt collectors, and you had to pay the Roman government, so you got a cut from the money that you collected, and then you gave the rest to the Roman government. So you were kind of playing against your Jewish people, but you were still working with the Roman government. And at that time, tax collectors were absolutely hated. Jesus had a tax collector, a former tax collector, on his staff and on his team. His name was Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, former tax collector. Now Jesus finds possibly the boss, Matthew's previous boss, and his name is Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. So not only did they can't, couldn't stand him, they actually hated him. So it says in uh, verse 3 that he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. He was too short to see over the crowd. As a matter of fact, um, his name is, he was one of the shortest men that were ever recorded in the Bible. He's probably taller than Nehemiah, Nehemiah. Nehemiah was probably a taller man, but Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And what a wee little man was he. If you grew up in Sunday, Sunday school, you know what I'm talking about. But it says, so he ran ahead because he was short, climbed the sycamore fig tree beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, come down, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Well, Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner. They grumbled. The crowd grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor. Lord, and if I have cheated people on their taxes, and you did, by the way, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. I love this passage. Anytime I read the Bible, I love using my imagination. Can you remember, can you see Zacchaeus, how tall he is? Not very tall. We don't even know how tall he is, but you know, people weren't very tall in that day anyway. So he must've been really, really short. So now what you've got is this man who's a notorious sinner, number one. Number two, he's hated by the people. He's already got a couple of things against him. Number one, he is already hated. Number two, he's at a height disadvantage. Hated and his height. Now I want you to say this, I wanna say this, that if you're short, this is not, nothing to do with you, okay? I was once a shorter kid. As a matter of fact, we were short growing up, we were late bloomers, that there was this old song back in the day called Short People, and I hated that song. It was such like the worst song. That song would never fly today. That song is so politically incorrect, it's not even funny. And the words that I talked about short people ain't got this, they don't have that, and I would cry because my brother was short and he was getting picked on because he was short when he was in boarding school on Oahu when we were growing up on the Big Island. And I'd remember him because the kids would pick on him all the time. I have a soft spot for being short. I was uh, shorter when I was a kid. I remember being shorter, not being able to um, be as good as you could in sports. And it was very, very difficult. Zacchaeus, for some reason, has an uncontrollable um, disadvantage in his life during that time because of his height. But I also want you to know, not only was it his height was his disadvantage, but it's also that he was hated. Now, hated probably his own fault. His, his height had nothing to do with his fault. That's just the way it was. That's the, that was genetics. But his choices got him into a place where the people could not stand him. But I want you to notice something. There are three types of people in our lives that we've got to be concerned about. The first one is the crowd. Now, the crowd was there to see Jesus, of course. And Zacchaeus couldn't get through the crowd. He couldn't see. 
So he climbed up a sycamore fig tree. He was a smart man. He couldn't get through. One thing I, I want to tell you about the crowd. The crowd is fickle. The crowd will turn coat on you. Crowds, they, they become more concerned about what people say about you rather than what God says about you. Right now, you can't be so concerned about what the crowd says. Crowd cannot be more important than what God has to say about you because the crowds, they're unpredictable. Right now, crowds are rioting. Right now, crowds are attracting other people that want to just jump in on the fun and, 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 and say that they're there. And right now, you don't want to be a part of the crowd or the herd, as some people call them, or the crowd. The crowd will turn on you. Social media profiles, people hide behind the crowd. Uh, popping off, and they pop out. They bounce in, but they bounce out. They blow in, they blow up, and they blow out. Has anybody done that to your Instagram, your Facebook, your social media account? It's happened to mine. It's happened to mine. Because you know why? People hide behind the crowd. And you don't want to be in that crowd, church. And if you're in that crowd that pops in, pops up, and blows out, and, and pfft, come on now. We got to be better than that. We, we operate with honor. And let's be careful on how we cancel people. The crowd is all about a cancel culture. The crowd is all about ghosting you. That's what the crowd does. And you know what? This crowd, even though he was hated and he had, a, had short in stature, you don't want to be concerned about the crowd. You want to be more concerned about the cloud. Because the Bible tells us that we have such a great cloud of witnesses that are cheering us on to the faith that you and I are running. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, who is the great cloud? Well, the great cloud was Enoch, who walked with God, and then God took him up. The cloud is people like Moses. The cloud were people who've gone before us, heroes of the faith, listed in Hebrews chapter 11. Those are the people in the cloud. As a matter of fact, the word is stadia, like stadium. And we have a stadium of witnesses that are in the cloud. Not the cloud that you store all your stuff up in that I wouldn't trust anyway. Okay, I'm going to get all my stuff off the cloud. Clint, let's get my stuff off the cloud, please. Thank you, Clint. We're going to get my stuff off the cloud. Because I don't trust the cloud, but I trust the other cloud. The cloud that I trust is the cloud of witnesses that are, have gone before us. Um, people of the faith um, who have fought the good fight and have finished the race. They are the cloud. Forget the crowd, run with the cloud. Third group of people that you need to run with? Hmm. Your corner. Your corner. You got a crowd? Mm -mm. You got a cloud? Absolutely. And then you've got your corner. My friend Sean Nepstad sent me, sent me a boxing glove in his book, with his book called Don't Quit in the Dip. Now, I'm not promoting his book right now because this is our program. I'm promoting my book called The Pound for Pound Principle. You know what it comes out of? Boxing, pound for pound. MMA fighting, pound for pound. That's how you're measured. But I'm telling you right now, if you are an MMA fighter or if you are a boxer, you got somebody that is in your corner. Woo, look at this. Left-handed haymaker, waymaker. Knock somebody out. Left jab. Coming with a roundhouse right. Because you know why? Right here, you need somebody that is in your corner. Not just one, one person. You need a circle in your corner. And your corner, if you're a fighter, you got a cut man, you got a manager, you got a coach, you got a trainer, you got a nutritionist. I heard LeBron James spends a million dollars a year maintaining his body with nutrition at the optimum level, okay, so that what, what he can do and become the greatest basketball player that he wants to be of all time. Can't get close to Michael Jordan, though. But anyway, he's still amazing because why? That's who's in his corner. My question is, when you're getting beat up and busted up in life, forget the crowd. The crowd turns against you. You want the cloud? And you got to know who's in your corner. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Somebody throw me some shakas in the chat. Pastor Mike is preaching. Think about this for a moment. The crowd can do something to our faith. Gets us stuck. Makes us wallow in self-pity. Makes us look at ourselves and realize, I don't have what you have. I didn't buy what you bought. I want your life. Do you realize that most people don't put terrible stuff up on their Instagram? They put only the best stuff. They, they curate that stuff. You look at my Instagram profile, and I wish you would. Follow me on Instagram, at Mike Kai. Okay, I could use about 300 more followers. Push me over the 10,000 mark, please. Just plain, kind of. Think about this for a moment. 
What are you going to throw up on your Instagram? Only the best? Not the worst moments of your life. Not the ugliest moments. Not when you just woke up. This is what I look like when I woke up. The crowd does not really care. It's the cloud in your corner. They're the most important people. The crowd can hold you back. The crowd can stifle your growth. The crowd gets you preoccupied. The crowd makes you go, where did the time go today? What did I do? Was I productive at all today? Like, like, like. Comment, comment, comment. Think about this for a moment. Zacchaeus, he needs to push through the crowd. And if you're taking notes today, and it's been highly proven that people take notes, get a nicer house in heaven. It says this, I want you to write this down, that if you're going to be like Zacchaeus and have great faith, like in a moment like this and in a season that we're in, number one, you have to have faith to run ahead of the crowd. You have to have faith to run ahead of the crowd, not with the crowd, ahead of the crowd. The Bible says, so he ran, verse 4, so he ran. He couldn't see because of his height. Maybe the people were boxing, boxing him out, like I would box you out if you tried to get a rebound on me, box you out. Maybe they wouldn't let Zacchaeus, they couldn't stand him. No, we, you don't deserve to see Jesus. You don't deserve to get to Jesus. No, nope, no, sir. But his current circumstances had him stuck. He wanted to see, but he couldn't. His stature, not necessarily on how tall he was, but maybe the way that he was respected, the optics of his life kept him down. Maybe this is all he could do with his life. But now it's time to change. So what does he do? He runs ahead of the crowd. Church, don't freeze in a season like this. Don't run away, but run ahead. Don't run away, but run ahead of the crowd. The herd mentality, the crowd mentality. Be an independent thinker that is in touch with the Word of God, filled with the Spirit of God, who Holy Ghost it before they post it, that is making sure that they're run, not like the crowd, not with the crowd, but they are running ahead of the crowd. Somebody say, say amen. You got to be able to find those moments, find those pockets of clarity in order to get to the place and position yourself where you need to be. To have great faith, you got to run ahead of the crowd because the crowd might be holding back your faith. Run ahead of the crowd. Number two, have faith to climb above the crowd. Have faith to climb above the crowd. It says, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road for Jesus was going to pass that way. See, he sees the crowd coming, um, problems coming, the wave of discouragement is creeping up, but he doesn't want to get stuck because he knows what being stuck is like. He knows what it's like to stay where he's at. So he gets out of his character and he runs. Because why? Because Jewish men didn't run. They got no cardio back in those days. The Jewish men didn't run, especially an older man. But what does he do? He hikes up his skirt. It wasn't a skirt. It was a tunic. And he lifts up his robe and he runs and tries to find himself with his Tiva sandals, dusty all over the place. I don't like Tivas. I don't like Birkenstock and I don't like Tivas. I'll wear slippers, rubber slippers, everybody. And he rolls up his robe, puts on his tivas. If you live in the Northwest, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he climbs the sycamore fig tree so he can get a higher look at Jesus. You got to have faith to climb above the crowd. Number one, you get ahead of the crowd. Number two, you go above the crowd. And he's getting above the crowd so he can get a better glimpse of Jesus. And it's not so Jesus can see him. It's so that he can see Jesus. And when he goes above, it's not about Jesus looking for him. It's him looking for Jesus. Because why? Because Jesus, I guarantee you, was going through Jericho, being God who he is, already knew. I got an appointment with a wee widow man. And his name is Zacchaeus. And I'm looking for Zacchaeus. And he's walking, and Zacchaeus makes himself known. Unbeknownst to us, maybe that was his motivation. I want Jesus to see me. I want Jesus to see me. Or maybe it was like, I just want to get a better look at this guy. I've heard so much about him. This man is my one chance in a lifetime. And he gets a look at him and something happens to him. Because why? Because of his faith. Guys, you got to get a faith to run ahead of the crowd and you got to have faith to rise above the crowd. Rise above the crowd. He climbs the tree. He doesn't care that he's going to be laughed at. He doesn't care what people think about him. He doesn't care what people think and say. He needs to do what he needs to do in order to see Jesus. See, climbing above, 
gives you vision. Climbing above gives you clarity. And it helps you see above the issues of life when you climb above. It's like taking the higher road, the higher road. This past weekend, the in-person services, I talked about how the Roman centurion could have conscripted Jesus and told him to come over to my house now because he was a Roman centurion. He could have pulled rank on Jesus earthly-wise, but he didn't. He didn't. He wanted to see Jesus. But the Roman centurion wanted Jesus to do something for him, but didn't want to see Jesus. He sent delegation after delegation. First, he sends the elders, and the elders come. He deserves to come and and please heal his servant. This Roman centurion built our synagogue. Uh, He's a good man, and he deserves Jewish elders on his behalf, everybody. He's a Gentile, but they love him so much that they go for him. Then Jesus says, I'll go, and Jesus starts walking closer. Jesus Jesus wants to go meet this man and heal the servant. But then his friends show up and verbatim repeat what he's supposed to repeat that the centurion told him to say. Do not come. I'm not worthy. That's why I didn't even come to see you. He said, he's not worthy. That's why I didn't even come to see you. He also said, Jesus, that he is a man under authority. When he says go, this one goes. He says do that, that one does that. And Jesus looked around and go, my gosh, I haven't seen this kind of... I'm amazed. I haven't seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. What I found it interesting was he sent two different delegations of people to pretty much send the message but not let Jesus come in. I wonder if the Roman centurion allowed Jesus to come into his home, not only would he have healed his servant, but he would heal the centurion's heart. The centurion Wanted what Jesus could do for him. Great faith, though. But did not want to see Jesus face to face. Zacchaeus did whatever he needed to do. Two different kinds of faith here. They're both legit. Two different kinds of faith. Zacchaeus did whatever he needed to do. Bobbed and weaved through crowds. Ducked under somebody's legs because he was short. Walked up. You know what I'm talking about? Climbed up with his tevas all the way up to the top to take a look at Jesus. Did whatever he could so that he could see Jesus. Faith. God still works with different kinds of faith. But we've got to have faith that runs ahead of the crowd, rises above the crowd. And number three, we have to have faith to find Jesus in the crowd. Finding Jesus in the crowd. It says in verse 5, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus! Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. In other words, he said, I'm going to be a guest in your home today. I'm coming to your house. I'm coming into your space. You're going to entertain me. You could probably, Eastern hospitality demanded it. Chief tax collector got a nice house. Feet washed, come into the home. Nice, cool towel, wash your face, wash your hands. Let the feast begin. Zacchaeus lets Jesus find him within the crowd. What are we doing different for God to find us in the crowd? In other words, the Bible says, I don't have it memorized where, the address, but the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are for him. Are you distinguishing yourself from the rest of the crowd? So Jesus, he sees you. Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. Are you standing out because of faith? Are you standing out because of trusting God no matter what's going on in this season? Are you standing out? Right now, we must look like fools, don't we? to the rest of the world, to the rest of the crowd. But man, I'd rather be a fool for Jesus. Because I I didn't find Jesus. Jesus found me. He found me in the crowd. And I'm so grateful that He saved me. And I'm so grateful that He came into my life. And I'm so thankful that He picked me. The Bible says many are called, but few are chosen. And He picked you. 
And for such a time like we live in now, for that this time, what distinguishes us and differentiates us from the crowd before we get to the cloud is finding faith and trusting God that He sees you right now, whatever you're going through. So I, I don't know if you lost your job or I don't know if you got a furlough coming. I don't know if it's getting crazy up in your house that, oh, you got family time now, but now the family getting on your nerves. <laughs> I don't know if you feel like your walls are closing in on you and that house that seemed, apartment seemed big enough now seems so tight, so small. But I want you to know that God sees you, that He loves you, that He's with you, and that He is for you. And no matter what's going on in your life right now, no matter what's going to come down the road, that what's going to get us through this is faith. Faith, not in faith, but faith in God. Faith in Jesus, being empowered by the Holy Spirit, and trusting Him. You know, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing and hearing the Word of God. In other words, the more you read your Word, the more faith you get. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by this Word. Let's make sure that in this season, that we're found more in the book than we're found more on our ground. Found more in this space, right here, building up your corner, help contributing to someone else's corner, never forsaking the assembling of ourselves as some are in the habit of doing, according to the writer of Hebrews, that we don't stop, that we keep on going. Have faith, trust God, you're gonna make it. You'll make it through this season. God's coming to strengthen you right now as He's strengthening all of us right now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, what are you waiting for? <laughs> what are you waiting for? Today's the day of your salvation. Surrender. Let down your pride. Let down your reservations. Release it. Let it go and trust Jesus. Let Him come into your heart, change you from the inside out, give you a new beginning, a fresh start, forgiveness, and change you at this moment. That's what Jesus does. And if that's you, and you want to pray that prayer, don't swipe off. We're not done yet because I got an important announcement at the end. And here it is. Just surrender your life to Jesus. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for loving me, accepting me, forgiving me. I'm yours. My life belongs to you. I surrender my life to you. Thank you for loving me before I first loved you. Teach me to follow you. Put myself above the crowd. Run ahead of the crowd. Look toward the cloud. But thank you for my corner and thank you for my faith. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And if you just prayed that prayer, I want to welcome you to the family of God. It's the prayer that I prayed when I was 21 years old. God has done a great work in so many people's lives. And I want you to continue on this journey right now. May the Lord bless you, keep you, cause His face to shine upon you, turn His countenance toward you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. That's the ironic blessing. Not ironic, but Aaron, Moses' brother, the ironic blessing. By the way, if you never got your opportunity for the Pound for Pound Principle, uh, go to MikeKai.tv and go get it there. It is, it is great. Right now, this is a book in season. Right now. Get that book. It's going to change your life or somebody else's life. Get it for them. Also, I want to tell you one more thing. Our new series starting this weekend, in person and online, it's called, Why You Trippin'? Why You, why you Trippin'? We're going to talk about the things that are stumbling Christians today. Make sure you join us online. Share it like nobody's business. Come to the in-person services if you are well enough and you can make it. Great. If you're not, please stay home. Continue to join us online and stay healthy. And come on, everybody, let's follow the rules. Aloha. Love you.